let you know up front, we're not going to answer all the questions you have about Dryad, but my uh, intention is to give you enough of a foundation and an understanding that going forward, you'll know what kinds of questions to ask, what, uh, what answers you need uh, in order to either use Dryad or make a decision about you uh, submitting data to them. Okay, so moving forward, uh, this is the Dryad home screen. And, you know, it says, who are we, what we do, how it works. But in my experience, uh, whenever I say, suggest something to my wife, like let's build a big greenhouse in the backyard or put in a putting green or a golf simulator. Uh, the one question she always has is, well, what's it going to cost? So until I answer that, she doesn't really care about what it's good for, how we're going to implement it, anything like that. So let's just get cost out of the way first, because uh, that's an important consideration. So Dryad is, it's a nonprofit. And to use Dryad, to, to search Dryad, to find data sets, to download data sets, there's no cost at all. So in that sense, Dryad is free. Um, if you want to upload your data to Dryad, um, there is a, a cost of $150 per data set. Uh, there are kind of overage fees if you submit really, really large data sets, but uh, 50 gigabytes is kind of the cutoff, and that, that's a lot of data. So you can think $150 anytime you need to upload a, a data set that corresponds to your research. Uh, so you can also have an institutional membership. Uh, which the uh, a lot of UC uh, universities do, University of Nevada does. And that may seem like a lot of money, uh, perhaps $13,000 uh, for a, an institutional subscription. But when you think about all the data sets that are, are uploaded potentially at $150 a pop, it, it turns out to be cost effective. More importantly, it lets you become a member of the Dryad community and have input, help guide the development of it, and also defray costs for other people that can't afford to be an institutional member. So that's the cost. And this is a very quick look at the membership as it exists today. There are about 75 institutions. Uh, so we're in good company with, uh, there's Yale and MIT and Claremont et cetera, et cetera. And I expect this list to grow and grow and grow. Okay, so before I can really talk about Dryad, we need to talk about the open data movement generally to provide a context for Dryad. Uh, open data sharing, it's like Martha Stewart used to say, it's a good thing. Uh, there have been uh, numerous working groups that have addressed this. Uh, commissions in Europe, commissions in the United States, and they have, uh, the focus has been on developing a framework that defines good data practices. So this is a statement from a working group, essentially saying that uh, scientific progress is advanced by having good data management practices and letting people have access uh, freely and uh, re easily uh, um, reusable in an easily re reusable fashion uh, that it advances science. And so uh, the culmination of this is kind of embodied by what they call the fair principles. I'm sure you, many of you have heard of this, but essentially it, it rests on the concepts of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. So Good data uh, possesses those characteristics and good data repositories um, rest on those. Okay, uh, it, this idea of open data has also manifested itself in what we're all familiar with as the new NIH open data policy. It's a little over a year and a half old now, uh, which requires that if you are Applying for a, a grant, you have to submit a data management sharing plan. And importantly, uh, not only do you need to plan a budget for the managing and sharing of data, but you have to comply with the uh, plan. 
So compliance is a big thing. Uh, what it means is if you're out of compliance, you're not going to receive a grant or a grant renewal. Um, many other problems uh, inherent in that. There are also publisher expectations for open data sharing. Uh, when you submit a journal, uh, a manuscript now to a journal, uh, they often say uh, you need to comply with our journal data sharing policy. And it, you, you'll need to investigate that further. They provide some uh, generalist repositories that you can choose. Uh, Wiley has a number of journals, all with different policies. Some encourage data sharing, some expect it, some mandate it. So ecology and evolution, for example, uh, mandates that you share your data. And they say briefly, that you're required to format your data to uh, particular standards and archive them, clearly state where they're deposited, basically making them uh, findable, accessible, reusable. Uh, and I wanted to talk briefly about the landscape of data repositories. Uh, again, to put Dryad in this context. Uh, so NIH, of course, has uh, dozens or hundreds of specific repositories. Importantly, though, they say that uh, NIH doesn't endorse a particular repository. Some specific funding opportunities are tied to specific uh, data repositories, but generally they leave it up to the researcher uh, to determine what's best for their data, unless the, uh, the agency has a specific uh, mandate or requirement. Uh, so you can go to NIH and find a long, long list of uh, data repositories. And the, uh, the thing about these uh, specific data repositories, they are you know, sort of a, a gathering place for people to work in the field and they, they meet specific needs of the researchers. Um, so it, the National Institute on Aging asks you or suggests that you deposit your data in their repository, but they also say, and this is interesting, you should put it there or another approved site or both wherever possible. And they don't really uh, eliminate possibilities. So uh, you could certainly put it in a, a generalist repository as opposed to their specific repository. And they're not always clear about uh, what, what requirements you have to meet. But I wanted to talk about uh, discipline-specific repositories just very, very briefly. What distinguishes them, in addition to being focused on particular subject, discipline, and kind of data, is that they often have tools and software that you can use to further analyze the data. So they provide kind of a sandbox for researchers who not only uh, want to upload their data, but look at other people's data and experiment with it, incorporate it into their own research. Uh, similarly, this uh, metabolomics workbench data repository has a suite of tools for analysis and visualization of the data. So those kinds of research or repositories have a kind of a, a, an enlarged function. In addition to just making the data available, they have you know, tools and uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a, an experimental environment where you could work with the data. So when you're choosing a repository, there are really two questions you have to ask yourself. Do you want to share the data or do you have to share the data? Uh, the first question is for researchers who want to who want other people to actively engage with their data and who want to actively engage with other people's data and be able to experiment with it and run it through these um, kind of software and analysis platforms and really play around with it. The other question, do you have to share your data? Those are for people who say, see, my, I got a grant, but they say I have to put it someplace. And I, all I want to do is be compliant with that requirement. You know, I don't care. I just want to meet the, the uh, requirements of the grantor or, or, the, or the publisher. So if you have to do it, that kind of shapes uh, the direction you may go 
in order to, um, to comply with the, the needs of the either the publisher or the grantor, which brings us to Dryad. Uh, Dryad is a, a what they call a generalist repository. And that's not a bad thing. Um, what makes Dryad one of the emerging important players in uh, the repository world is they're, they're an open data platform, they're a nonprofit, but they have a, a commitment to open availability and long-term um, maintenance of data. So it's, there is a, a community of institutions and publishers all working together to accomplish this goal. And then one of the, some of the nice things about Dryad that make it particularly useful, especially for those people that just wanna be in compliance, it, it complies generally with most funder and publisher requirements. It will automatically assign a DOI it provides metrics to track how your data is viewed and shared and cited, downloaded. It curates your, your data sets so that your, your data is in compliance with fair standards. So when you upload files, someone is reviewing the data and saying, okay, you check all the boxes, this is okay. Or maybe it's not in compliance and they'll let you know and work with you uh, uh, as in an editorial fashion to help you bring your data into compliance. Uh, it accepts a lot of different file formats. It integrates with another repository called Zenodo, which is um, a European platform uh, managed by uh, the CERN labs. And that lets you upload files and data that uh, Dryad really isn't uh, built to accommodate. So if you have computer code or scripts or supplemental information, uh, or things that don't meet uh, kind of their uh, acceptability for like copyright, uh, you can upload it to Zenodo and they, they can manage those kinds of alternative uh, data formats. And then as they said, they have a long-term commitment to preserving and managing the data. So uh, it's not going to be one of those things where you put all your data in and they, they go out of business, which would be quite unfortunate. Uh, supports a lot of file types. This is just a screenshot of uh, some records in uh, Dryad. So you know, they have CSV files and image files. They have TIFF files and Excel files. So it accommodates nearly anything you can throw at it. Uh, I just wanted to point out too that you can uh, upload things through Dryad into Zenodo. So there's a, a, a software designation. If you wanted to take a look at that software, you could just click on the link and, and download it. Um, I just want to make that clear. Okay, how to use Dryad? You know, one, there are two sides to Dryad. One is searching and finding and downloading data, and the other is uploading data. So looking first at how to search, and I'm not going to go into detail because it's, you know, it's not hard, uh, especially for uh, librarians and people that are used to searching databases, but you can search for traffic noise and then it gives you a list of the, the 42 hits that deal with traffic noise. And then you click on a, a particular record and it gives you the record information. Uh, here's the DOI that would link you to the, the data set. You could go to your uh, data file versions and see there's an Excel file and you could download that or you, and a readme file, you could download them individually or download a full data set. I wanted to point out too that uh, it provides metrics. So it shows how many views uh, a data file had, how many downloads, how many times it's been cited. So very kind of rich um, data on the use of your data file. So which could be very valuable. Um, just to uh, help kind of define the impact of your scholarly contributions, good for promotion and tenure uh, and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, if you downloaded an Excel file, here it is. You know, it's, you can just download data and look at it. 
This is sometimes those data files have very little meaning for me. This one I could kind of understand that you have birds and sex and uh, all the various uh, kind of fields and attributes that they were interested in in the study. Uh, the integration with Zenodo, this is uh, some uh, a snippet of code that someone had uploaded and you can in turn find it, download it. Uh, you can also search by institution. So if you wanted to search for University of Nevada, Reno, you could see all the 241 uh, data sets that have been uploaded. Um, and uh, now let's move to uh, uploading data files. Just want to stay on schedule. Uh, they recommend that you keep your individual files under 10 gigabytes, which is not terribly hard to do. I, when I look through Dryad, even some of the larger files are like two or three gigabytes. Uh, so that's an individual file limitation. Um, a data set can go up to 300 gigabytes, but there are overage costs, which uh, we looked at briefly earlier. So. You know, if you go up to 300 gigabytes instead of $150 fee, it's, it's going to be almost 2,000. My math is right on that. So you want to try and keep your set smaller if you are interested in saving money. Okay, submission requirements, they spell out the accepted data. Uh, the most important thing is that they only accept items that are compliant with the Creative Commons Zero Waiver. Uh, you know, you can look all this up on the website. Uh, they don't accept um, things that are, um, uh, or how do you say this, that, that it has to adhere to IRB regulations. They, you don't want to expose patient information or human subjects data. Um, uh, so th there, are, there are some things you need to be aware of when you're uploading data. Um, to get started in Dryad, and it's, you know, the process is, is really simple. It's, it's just like getting started with any other platform. Uh, you log in and you create a profile. Uh, it's like, you know, setting up a, a account with your cell phone provider. You log in, you have a profile, you answer a lot of questions. Uh, one of the key things though, in accessing Dryad, is that you need an ORCID account. Uh, and we, sh we all should have ORCID accounts anyway, so not a big deal. But you use your ORCID account to get started. You sign in using ORCID. If you have an institutional account, you could also access through your institution. Doesn't really matter either way. So you set up your account, tells you what fields are required. Uh, it links to your ORCID and you're done. Now to upload a data set, same thing. It kind of walks you through it. You describe your data set, you prepare a readme, you upload your files, you review them. So you, uh, and if, if it's linked to a manuscript, you give the journal information and a manuscript number and your name and your affiliation. Uh, it, you know, what's the research domain? where it was funded, if it was funded from someplace. Uh, you create a kind of a brief method section, you assign keywords, you can kind of see where this is going. Uh, it asks for other things, not, not all uh, required. It, it has an asterisk if something is a required field. You prepare a readme file. And there is a, you could either type it in or you could import it. And then give a description of your data and file structure and some other information. And then you upload your file. So if it's data, you know, if it's a CSV or an Excel file or a TIFF or a JPEG or a number of different things, you could enter it here. If it's a software code, et cetera, you choose the files and then you upload it. And if it's supplemental information, uh, figures or supporting tables, or, or sometimes it's things that don't fall within the Creative 
Commons license um, purview, but it's still something that is shareable. Zenodo is a little more relaxed about the kinds of information that they will um, support and make available. So, you know, you, you just make that call. Uh, you know, it, it's like anything else. You, you go to your desktop, you select a file, you upload it. It tells you if it has passed a basic check and then you proceed to review. Okay, so uh, you review your data set. You could always edit things and sometimes it will remind you that you made a mistake someplace, you had to fix something and then you can go back. You can also choose when to pub publish. You can make it available immediately. Uh, at, that is after it's past the curation pro process. And one of the good things about Dryad, someone looks at your data, reviews it and said, well, there's a problem here, a problem there uh, that you need to fix. Or, you know, this is a copyrighted file and we can't publish this. You need to find another way of um, you know, doing this. Uh, you can uh, sometimes, if, uh, journal will have like a double blind process where people need to look at your data, but they don't, they can't, they shouldn't be able to see who the data belongs to. So you could keep your data set private to facilitate that kind of review process. Um, and then you just check the box that you're in agreement to the uh, license uh, constraints and that you have agreed to dry its terms of service and you're going to pay or your institution will pay. And then bingo, you're done. Thank you for your submission. Uh, and uh, after it's uploaded, you get an email from them saying, okay, it's been assigned some links. There's a reviewer link. They have assigned a DOI like immediately, which is pretty amazing. And then you can have a, a link to check the status of your application. They review it to make sure that everything's fine. And that is the process. So this tells me that I'm done with my discussion uh, I hope this sheds some light on Dryad briefly. Uh, here is what's next and a link to say how we did. And I guess uh, we have five minutes, so I could take some questions. I can't guarantee that I have answers, but I'm willing to try. Thank you, Terry. So I did put the um, info for our survey link. Um, and our next presentation in the chat, and I do see we've got some chats coming in. Uh, what metadata schema are used in Dryad is being asked. I'm not sure about that. Can you elaborate when you say metadata schema? Oh, well, there, there is a, there's a readme file, of course, and the, the readme, if, if that's what you're thinking about, the README explains what uh, what types of data are included in your various files. So there will be descriptors for uh, the data elements. Uh, you know, the, the other things that are uh, implicit in describing your data. Um, and that's the nice thing about the editorial process. They, they review your files and say, your metadata is improperly described. You need to go back and provide labels uh, and attributes for the data, other things. You know, I'm, I, I think it, it just depends on the kind of data files you're submitting. I, I don't know. That's the best I can come up with right now. Other questions? Alexander has added a little bit. Uh, the person who, who asked the question says, thanks. Alexander's also added some. Um, that data shared in Dryad will be described with the data site metadata schema? Yeah, yeah that's true. And I, I would just uh, point you towards data site to learn more about that. I mean, it's just, it's not something I want to go into right now. Okay. All righty. Uh, do we have any further questions? through in the chat or elsewhere. 
I don't see anyone typing. So I guess we will conclude. Thank you very much, Terry, for uh, your presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining. OK, great. Well, I hope this has uh, shed some light on uh, Dryad, been helpful in some way. Thank you all for attending. Bye.